you're interested in music, it's a fascinating time to be alive right now. There's never been more work across more genres available to more people at the press of a button. There's not just more good music coming out now, but it's never been easier to access lost genres and hidden treasures. If you like 30s swing, 50s bebop, 70s Americana or 90s hip hop, it's easier now to go through the archives than it was 20 years ago. And the accessibility of a wider range of genres to new artists thanks to the digital revolution has meant that more new exciting music is being made now than ever before. Better transport has made it easier for small bands to tour and to gain international exposure. You used to need a recording contract to put out an album, but now all you need is a below average computer and, in some cases but not all, a musical instrument. Musical production today is incredibly decentralised, which is great for the quantity of music being released. More music coming out means more good music to listen to. But can we really say that all these changes are purely beneficial? More music being released means more choice, but it also means the value of the average song has plummeted. Even for the music that is worth your time, it's now a separate question whether that music is worth your money. Is Spotify a net benefit to the music industry? Or has streaming simply eroded people's willingness to pay for art further? And if the answer to that is yes, are these negative impacts still outweighed by the positive ones? By the lower cost of entry? By the re-emergence of vinyl? By the breaking of the monopoly on production held by big ticket executives? By the ability for anyone with something to say to go out and say it? If we want to make a judgement on the ultimate health of the music industry, we need to consider all of these things. There is nuance in a question as loaded as, is music getting better? And this nuance is forsaken in every comment section of every YouTube video of every Beatles performance in which every boomer in every continent seems to have commented, ah yes, back when they played real instruments. Have these individuals really gathered enough information to cast a final judgement on the industry? Have they really considered a wide enough range of events occurring in the music scene? Or are they simply stating a preference between Stairway to Heaven and WAP? To make a judgement about the health of the music sector based on a comparison like this would be short-sighted. It would be to fall victim to availability bias. It would be ignorant of the broader context. Context is important. Without context, we don't have much at all. If you follow politics even remotely, you'll probably have heard the word neoliberalism. I can't stand this word. Apart from some strange folks on certain social media sites, it's pretty much always an insult. Neoliberalism is, in its most common usage, a stick for beating conservatives with. <laughs> In this capacity, it's used against pretty much anyone on a spectrum between Bill Clinton and Ayn Rand, and, often used synonymously, is a second trope you may have heard. Trickle down economics. Trickle down economics don't work. Trickle down economics. Trickle down economics is when we let the rich piss on you and we tell you it's raining. So when people get up and about using these terms, what are they referring to? What do they actually mean? To quote Danny Rogic, neoliberalism is used as a catch-all for anything that smacks of deregulation, liberalisation, privatisation or fiscal austerity. Policy is most commonly associated with the agendas pursued by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the 80s. For their supporters, Thatcher and Reagan were at the vanguard of a revolution which reversed the stagnation, inflation and decay which had dominated the 70s. And to detractors, these same reforms were merely an abdication of responsible government by a bunch of racists. An abdication which turbocharged the inequality and paved the way for the reckless corporate profiteering and gunslinging that caused future crises. This had all occurred in response to an era of rapid growth in government size and scope between the 1930s and 70s. This growth, by historical standards, was unique across history. Democratic governments had never taken on the role in society that they began to occupy in the 30s. And this is because before the 1930s, most democratic policy making was dominated by what we'd now call classical economics, a fundamental belief in the power of markets. A consensus that the best way for governments to deliver growth is to remove any barriers to trade and competition, enforce property rights, and then get out of the way. Markets may still fluctuate, but they will always absorb the demands of consumers through changes in quantity and price. Technological change makes uncompetitive industries either adapt or die. Perfect competition means that everyone who wants a job will, eventually, get one. And in the long run, this is all true. Classical economics is right, eventually, in the long run. But the interesting question here is if we do run into a problem in our economy and we're not able to immediately re-achieve long-run output, how long do we wait? There's a number of very quotable quotes you can attribute to John Maynard Keynes, but my favourite one's this. In the long run, we are all dead. In the Great Depression of the 30s, governments and banks sat and waited, in the belief that higher unemployment levels would see workers accept lower wages for the same work, that these lower wages would allow businesses to produce more goods at a given price level, allowing production to recover naturally. Keynes looked at this and rightly asked, 
Does the world really work like that? Do wages really magically go down when the economy tanks? And even if they do eventually go down, is our best response to sit around waiting for things to recover on their own? Is there something else we can do here, you know, about all these hungry, miserable people? Keynes proposed that government could step in when there's a demand-driven downturn like what occurred in the 1930s in the Great Depression. More government programs to generate activity, lower interest rates to get investment moving, government job programs to boost employment, government stepping in directly when business wasn't up to the task. Keynes might have spent most of his spare time hanging out with other academic elites in Bloomsbury, but he was also a skilled enough communicator that he was able to make policymakers listen. His ideas were harnessed across the Anglosphere especially, and the 30s to the 70s saw an explosion of government activity. FDR's New Deal in the US, and the post-war consensus in the UK, saw governments intervene to employ workers where the private sector wouldn't. The nationalisation of weak industries too, which previously may have been simply allowed to collapse, causing unemployment to rise further. We also saw the birth of a fledgling welfare state in these countries, with government accepting a new level of responsibility for pulling up the disadvantaged. The introduction of public health care, an expansion of education, and the introduction of more public housing. Policies which, for the first time ever in some of these countries, were considered to actually provide a net benefit to the public. Keynesian economics couldn't have arrived or been implemented at a better time. In the UK, which had been on its knees after World War II, there wasn't just a reduction in absolute poverty, but improved social mobility, workforce stability, living standards. Governments had been equipped with the tools they needed to meet the challenges of the post-World War II world. But, just as how Keynes taught that markets can be inflexible and slow to correct, so too can governments. You could be Gandhi, you could be George, but you'll always come up against the iron law that it's easier for governments to introduce new spending measures than to remove existing ones. Governments like giving away money, they don't like clawing it back. Government had evolved to meet new challenges, but the evolution was unidirectional. Governments were now big. And then along came the 1970s. The music was good, but the economics were miserable, not least due to the OPEC embargo, which saw oil prices skyrocket, increasing energy costs and inflation across pretty much every sector of every developed economy. In the UK, the trade unions that had grown out of the interwar period, and which had done so much meaningful work in keeping workers' rights moving forward, now demanded pay rises to keep up with inflation. Fair enough in isolation, fair enough. But this wasn't in isolation. Combined union demands with the declining competitiveness of key industries, top bracket tax rates above 80%, worker strikes which saw mountains of trash piling up at the side of the road, and three-day working weeks due to a minor strike in 1974, and all of a sudden the UK had landed in a situation where a lot of people were looking around and thinking, you know what, this probably isn't optimal. The UK's mixed model of social democracy needed to improve its ability to respond to these challenges in the 70s, but government moved slowly. Government wasn't able to do so fast enough without the bogey lady entering the scene and ripping through all the china in the china shop. And this destruction of all the china in the china shop is what we now might call neoliberalism. Margaret Thatcher brought to her prime ministership the worldview of thinkers like Milton Friedman and Friedrich von Hayek, and re-liberalised the UK economy, privatising industries from transport to telecommunications, playing hardball with the unions, joining the European single market to facilitate international trade, deregulating the financial sector, and overseeing an increase in interest rates to bring down inflation. At the same time, Ronald Reagan was pursuing similar reforms in the US. And largely thanks to these policies, inflation was brought under control. There was a boom in GDP thanks to the greater opportunities brought by fewer regulations in sectors such as finance. The UK saw a boom in international trade and the explosive growth of sectors previously constrained by public ownership and provision. The number of days lost through strikes tumbled. The economy of the UK became more productive, more competitive and more profitable. Thatcher and Reagan are remembered as consequential leaders because their legacies still loom large today. Defenders consider their reforms to have been a long overdue return to normalcy, a correction of the bloated government created in the names of Keynesian stimulus, and, most importantly, reforms which were embedded in these countries' institutions when they were incorporated into the ideologies of the Blair and Clinton governments, governments ostensibly of the centre-left, but which ultimately came to live rent-free in the centre, and until 2008 there was no cohesive movement against this ideological shift at all. But... The opening bell is going to ring 
in uh, five seconds, and to be honest with you, we wish it wouldn't. Your work on the phone say a lot of their customers are freaked out, waiting to see how low the Dow will go. They're focused on the Dow, not so focused on OPEC. Yes, OPEC did cut production by one and a half million barrels per day. Really, you're seeing just broad-based declines across all of the major technology sectors. 2008 was a turning point because 2008 saw enough cracks appearing in the paintwork that a new narrative could finally form. Because 2008 made clear one consequence of the finance sector deregulation that had occurred in the 80s, a lighting of the way for the Wild West profiteers and scumbags that caused the global financial crisis. The GFC begat the first widespread revisionism of the Thatcherite and Reaganite revolutions, and this revisionism begat the Occupy Wall Street movement, and the Occupy Wall Street movement begat the broader sense that neoliberalism has failed. And this sentiment wasn't confined to Wall Street. Soon more complex, more nuanced critiques were beginning to mount against the supply-side downsizing and deregulation of the 80s. Britain and the US had become wealthier countries, but what use is economic growth in isolation? What if it all goes to the top 1%? You can't eat GDP, you can't drink GDP, you can't live in GDP growth, you still need a fucking house. So should measures to increase GDP growth be enabled through the dismantling of welfare programs, of environmental degradation? When people say neoliberalism has failed, they imply that these policies to dismantle elements of the 30s to 70s welfare state in the pursuit of free market fundamentals have failed. That even if they have caused growth, they've increased inequality, they've propagated financial crises, they've destroyed the environment, they've made us fatter, they've generated winners, but they've also generated losers. And the losers are starting to finally realise that they've been duped. But here's where things get confusing. Here's where things become more challenging. And here's where the interesting conversations about the merits and detriments of individual policies and programs should begin to happen. But here's also where the terminology gets in the way. Many critiques of the legacies of Thatcher and Reagan are sound. You can draw a straight line between financial market deregulation and the global financial crisis. You can draw a straight line between the dismantling of welfare programs and increases in inequality and poverty. You can draw a straight line between the busting of unions and increases in unemployment in disadvantaged areas. But you can't draw a straight line from every supposedly neoliberal policy to every supposed economic consequence. You can't do what the neoliberalism has failed trope does by stealth. Free trade is a separate policy goal from financial sector deregulation. It has different costs and different benefits. It has different winners and it has different losers. If one's to say neoliberalism has failed, are they saying that both free trade and deregulation have failed? How about the principle of private property rights, of the enforcement of contracts, freedom of movement, a free-floating currency, control of inflation? Thatcher and Reagan argued in favour of all of these. Does that make each of these policies neoliberal in perpetuity? Are they all part of the same failed neoliberal experiment? Are they all trickle-down economics? Let's take international trade, for which the answer could be yes if you work in a sector exposed to cheap imports such as manufacturing or agriculture, but maybe not if you work in tech, or if you're a university researcher looking to collaborate with other researchers outside of your borders. Maybe not if you work for Jaguar, or Land Rover, or Airbus, or AstraZeneca. And maybe not if you work in film or TV or music and you're looking to grow your audience. Maybe the context matters too. The European Union was set up in 1992 primarily to eliminate the historical rivalries and conflicts that had plagued the continent for centuries if not millennia through increased economic and political integration, to cooperate on global externalities such as climate change, and to strengthen Europe's influence geopolitically. In doing this, the EU promotes free trade within its common market. Does this make the EU a neoliberal organisation? Perhaps. What about Australia? At the same time as Maggie and Ron were running wild up in the Northern Hemisphere, Australia's economy at the beginning of the 1980s was jettisoned, stagnant and isolated from its neighbours. But throughout the 80s, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating also oversaw a period of supply-side reform. Australia became globally integrated, its dollar was floated, and its financial sector was deregulated. Airlines and banks were privatised, free trade was emphasised with a further dismantling of protectionism, and an agreement between government and the unions was initiated to reduce pressure on wages. Does this sound familiar? If I told you Reagan pursued that agenda, it'd probably check out. These reforms all sound quite neoliberal to me. They'd definitely be considered in that light more frequently if Hawke and Keating weren't both Labor Prime Ministers. So if neoliberalism has failed, did Hawke and Keating fail? Both are still generally regarded as being of the centre-left. Hawke, Keating, Thatcher and Reagan weren't all good buddies. Hawke and Keating were genuine social reformers too. They enshrined indigenous land rights, introduced compulsory superannuation, and reformed collective bargaining rather than trying to dismantle it completely. Oh, and they introduced publicly funded universal healthcare. So were they neoliberals or not? Where's the dividing line? How many neoliberal points does one privatised bank earn you? 
How many for a free trade agreement? How many do you lose for one day of union strike action? How many do you lose for pursuing social reform? How are we measuring any of these things? What about the Chinese, who are also opening up in the 80s? Does their market liberalisation qualify as a success because of the living standards it increased across the nation? Or did it fail because open markets are exemplars of a failed neoliberal ideology? Does it make a difference that they were put in place by an authoritarian Asian government? Is neoliberalism a purely Western phenomenon? Can Asian countries also pursue trickle-down economics? What about what Germany did after World War II? What about Chile? What about the Chicago Boys? What about Pinochet? What about Peru? What about what Erzal did in Turkey? What about Taiwan? What about what Modi's doing in India right now? What about NAFTA? What about the prison industrial complex? What would Chomsky say? What about South Korea, New Zealand, imperialism? What about the International Monetary Fund? What are you talking about when you say that this thing called neoliberalism has failed? Are you talking about all of them or are you talking about specific cases? Because if you are talking about specific cases, refer to the specific cases. A bunch of the phenomena I've mentioned do, in fact, stink. But tell me which ones you're talking about, because the context for all of them is different. Neoliberalism could refer to 900 billion different policy measures implemented across 100 different countries. And when we cast a net that wide, we can't say they all either succeeded or failed. Their success was context dependent and without a counterfactual. Sweeping shallow political statements reduce the quality of the debate that we can have about individual measures. This is a shame because these conversations are worth having. Make the case for scaling up government involvement in greater social provision in the modern welfare state. We need intelligent people arguing for those things. The 1980s was a time where reform was needed to an extent. There were opportunities to increase wealth by deregulating sectors and removing barriers to participation. Some of these policies were successful in growing the pie. Others may have grown the pie, but they also increased inequality. And these effects varied policy by policy. And decades on, the world has changed again. The same policies introduced now wouldn't work the way they did in the 1980s because we do not live in the 1980s. People are living longer now. Our demographics are changing. The global economy is sticky taped together by debt. We have different expectations around healthcare and disability services. We have an imperative to reduce our carbon emissions now. Our geopolitical environment is more uncertain. Our tax systems need repurposing. AI could be on the verge of making all of our jobs redundant. Our cities are changing. Our educational requirements are changing. Labour markets are changing. The analogies from Marx are outdated because the working class aren't unionised textile workers anymore. They're now working in the gig economy, delivering you your dinner. And all of these are going to keep changing. We need to learn from history without being slaves to it, because we need to consider the accelerating changes in the ways we live now. And in order to do that, we need to put the past in context. And to do that, we need to be considered in the language we use. Context is how we learn what lessons to draw, which successes to incorporate, and which failures to abandon. And context makes meaningless, esoteric and archaic umbrella terms like neoliberalism unnecessary when we're talking about the future we want to build. 